Today I'm going to be unboxing this longer 3D printer. It seems nicely packaged. Wow, and look at this. It's not only longer, it's also taller and wider. On a normal Ender 3, you kind of have to put everything together yourself. But on this one, it comes with this top frame pre-assembled and the x-axis pre-assembled. These tie rods help stiffen everything up so you'll get consistent performance all the way up to the top. Now I'll install this z-axis stepper. They're using a nice metal bracket to hold this stepper motor in place. And if we turn our attention to the top of the machine, we're also going to install this lead screw support. And this will just help hold everything in place a little bit better. It would be nice to have dual z-axis lead screws, but this thing is around $200 cheaper than a CR10. Now we'll just plug all the wires in. It's not too difficult. The last piece I need to install is this touchscreen interface. Let's take a look under this fan shroud. Here we've got two blower fans and a hot end cooling fan. I'm just giving this machine a little tune up before I start printing. So the first thing I'm going to do is tighten this nut down. And that should ensure that this eccentric nut doesn't come loose after I make any adjustments to it. It wasn't loose enough that it would definitely cause problems, but I just make sure everything is in excellent condition before I get started with any printer. Let's look at this one. Looks like it's a little loose, so we'll tension this one too. This bed is held in place with six V-groove wheels. All three of them on the left side are adjustable. So I'm going to make sure the tension is set correctly on these three wheels. This one's pretty loose. This one's a little loose. If you can't fit your hands into that area, just unscrew this heated bed and lift it up so that you can see under here. With this heated bed off, it's actually a lot easier to make these wheel adjustments. So it's not a bad idea to take it off as part of the initial assembly. Now I've got these all adjusted to the correct amount of tension. Let's put it back together. So this strain relief was tucked away in here. So you're going to want to deploy that out the back. I'm a big fan of these silicone bushings, so I'm going to install these while I have this taken apart. I installed a couple of zip ties here just to hold this strain relief in place. To adjust the belt tension, you're just going to have to undo these two Allen screws. Just give this a pull until it's nice and tight, and then I'll tighten it down. Now we've finished the assembly, so we're ready to move on to printing. All I need to do is level the bed, and we'll see if we can get some good results out of this machine. And we're ready to power it up. They provided this piece of paper, which I assume is for bed leveling. Uh, looks like there's some instructions on it too. So I just went through this bed leveling procedure a couple of times, and it's actually a remarkably flat bed, so I think this is going to print pretty well. Alright, so let's go to File. Let's start with the whistle. Open. Yes, let's print it. So I'm just going to switch this over to time-lapse mode and let you watch this thing work. Here's a bunch of the prints that I made. This benchy turned out excellent. And this is a piece that I printed that really took advantage of the whole build area. You can see it's almost 300 millimeters across. And this was printed with the 0.4 millimeter nozzle. I also found a really cheap source for a large PEI print surface, but I don't think I really need to use this because I've been having really good luck with this glass print surface. All my prints have been sticking to this really well and they come right off when I'm done printing. The only deficiency that I could point out is this kind of scaly pattern that shows up on the bottom. Normally you don't see this because it only shows up on the top of the bottom wall of your print and it just gets encapsulated inside of your printed object. But this is one of the downsides of having a single z-axis screw is that on large flat surfaces like this, the filament can build up in such a way that it kind of gets scaly like this. I printed out this BMG mount adapter, so I should be able to convert this over to a direct drive extruder now. So I'm just going to yoink this off the build tray. Oh crap. Looks like my bed adhesion was too good here. By heating the print bed up all the way, I'm able to easily remove this PETG. We ran out of filament on this print job, which the machine has detected, and it's paused the print. Say yes, I want to change the filament. So let me try unloading. And you can see it's just spitting the filament out right here. I'll put my new filament in. I'm going to hit the load button. That load command ended up taking about three minutes, which is way too long for me. So I would actually recommend to just manually feed this filament in if you're ever in this situation. Now I can just go to the home tab and resume the print job. So it looks like that filament runout detection feature works pretty well. They're actually using some 3D printed parts here for the fan shrouds. And I gotta say, this is a really well designed assembly, but I think we can make it a little better. So what I've installed is a bimetallic heat break from Slice Engineering and a Bontech CHT nozzle. This nozzle has a one millimeter diameter. It should complement this large build volume quite well. So that wraps up our hot end upgrades. Time for the extruder upgrade. Oh shit! 
The only improvement I can make to the fit is you can see here from the side, it doesn't line up perfectly in this direction. So I'd need to bring the extruder forwards about four millimeters. I'll make the update to this model and then post it to Patreon where you can beta test it. I had to remove eight screws to take this enclosure off, which seems a bit excessive. So it looks like they're using three silent stepper drivers and one regular stepper driver that'll make a little bit of noise. This is on the extruder axis. Since the extruder tends to move pretty slow, they probably deemed it was okay to use a loud stepper driver here. But now that I'm using a geared stepper motor and I'm gonna be running it really fast, it might be a little bit louder. We've got really nice connectors for all the high power connections. So here's the power, the heated bed, and the heater block. Oh wow, they even threw a heat sink on the SD card holder. So that should help keep your micro SD card cool and maybe help it last a little bit longer. It's nice to see that you've got the option to plug in a second Z-axis stepper motor here. So if you want to run dual lead screws, you can do that. You'll just have to buy the upgrade parts and plug it in. Overall, this main board has a lot of options for expandability, so it's a pretty nice design. This here is the filament runout detector. I want to bypass it, so to trick the machine into thinking that filament is always installed, I'm just going to put this jumper across the pins and that will simulate a closed switch being across those two leads. So now the printer will always think that there's enough filament to do any job. All right, now this is a direct drive Bowden tube with a CHT hot end and a bimetallic heat break. Let's see how much faster I can print with it. Since I kept my old heater block, I don't need to retune my PID values, but I will need to change the number of steps per millimeter that the extruder takes. Since this is a three to one gear ratio, it's gonna to need to complete about three times as many rotations to extrude the same amount of filament. So I'm gonna increase the nozzle flow rate to four, four, six. So of course, immediately after I take off the filament runout detector, I have a filament runout that ruins a print. I guess it is pretty useful to leave it on there. So after printing with this longer LK5 for a week, these are the standout features that I've come to appreciate. It's got a huge build volume. I've always wanted a printer with a 300 by 300 build surface, but this one also goes up to 400 millimeters high. So you can print some really massive objects. I've switched this over to using a one millimeter CHT nozzle with a direct drive extruder, so I can print out large things really fast. For example, this entire orange thing, which is almost solid plastic, this was printed out in about 12 hours. And it's basically an entire one kilogram spool of PLA. So this is gonna be my go-to machine for making large-scale mechanical prototypes. I also really like the price of this machine. It starts at around $300. That's only slightly more expensive than the Ender 3 V2, but you're getting a huge build area and you really aren't sacrificing anything in terms of print quality or capabilities. But it's much larger, so it just opens up a lot more options for making cool stuff. Add to that, it has dual part cooling fans, so the fan setup on this machine is just superior to what you find on the Ender 3s. Overall, the touchscreen interface is really easy to use and really responsive, but it's missing a couple features. For example, when I added this BMG extruder, in order to reprogram the E steps or the extruder steps per millimeter, I had to plug it in with a USB serial connection and send G code commands to it to get it to update the steps per millimeter. That isn't that big of a deal. If you're making these kind of modifications, you should know how to send G code commands to your printer. I also noticed that the hot end and extruder had been test run from the factory because when I first started running it, there's some black filament coming out that I didn't put in there. So this has better quality control than you get on most of the entry-level Ender 3s. I think Longer has done a great job with this printer. I could totally recommend it to someone who's looking to get a cheap entry-level printer with an extra-large print volume.